Um, so let me introduce myself. Um, I'm from the Department of Protestant Theology, so I'm a theologian. I'm going to talk about biodiversity, and I actually have little knowledge about that, so bear with me. It's going to be a bit of speculation going on here. Um, so why talk about biodiversity in human space exploration? My idea behind that is that biodiversity has a certain understanding with it on Earth that should change once we try and approach this uh, and, and um, take this to space with us. Um, biodiversity is usually understood as a the diversity or the variability among living organisms. That means biodiversity means there is a lot of different organisms living in the same ecosystem or sharing an ecosystem and that includes diversity within species, between species and of course of different ecosystems and all this is not going to be there when we go into outer space. And when you look at the way biodiversity is perceived within society, um, it's almost always depicted when you when you try to find image, images about biodiversity as being really cute neat right it's never threatening it's it's almost human this panda who's sticking out his tongue um, there is a dangerous animal dangerous animal there but usually biodiversity is sort of neat and cute when you when you look at depictions sometimes even anthropomorphized, right? This frog is the curious frog that sort of relates to us and that's why we think biodiversity is something that is good. You can also find images where actually there's a comparison made between one limb of different species that gives the idea that biodiversity basically means we're all in this together. So by the, the idea of biodiversity through media depiction goes from a diversity of different organisms within the same ecosystem or within different ecosystems to we are all in this together, this is one organism. We're all connected. And this is true for Earth as on Earth evolution of this ecosystem has given us this interconnectedness, this interconnected ecosystem and um, it's almost portrayed in a way that relates to the biblical reference from uh, the book of Isaiah when the Messi Messiah comes um, that the lion, where's the lion in that one? Where's the lion? That's the lion will lie with the lamb, right? So there will be peace between different species who usually do not live together very well. So I th my, my point would be that within a cultural depiction, biodiversity Present, is presented as a peaceful living together of different species that would not, that do not actually live together in this peaceful way. And this does influence our ethical understanding of that. So when we are all interconnected, and I found this graphic on the internet and there's so much wrong with it that I would like to spend a couple of minutes with that. It's actually, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's just lovely, right? Um, so this as you can see, this is all plainly wrong. The human male is at the top of the pyramid. That's wrong. The human female and the whale are right next to each other. That is wrong too. So there's a, there's a lot of assumptions in there that they sort of go. So and any we have this strata, right? Obviously these things seem to be better, higher than the others. I wonder why they chose a whale and not a dolphin. That's what I would have expected. But this model on the other side seems to be the right model. And let me say that as a theologian, I mean, this is sort of everything mixed together. There is no strata, there is no, no hierarchy in that one. But what appeals to me as a theologian is that the human female is still right next to the snake, so at least there's something I can relate to. Um, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that when we talk about biodiversity, we always carry this cultural understanding, this ethical framing with us. And I think if we want to talk about biodiversity in new environments, we will need to find different ways of, of, um, of approaching that, different ways of, of talking about it. So what 
threatens biodiversity when you are thinking about spaceflight. And this is actually one of my favorite pictures. Um, a cataclysmic event, the asteroid that destroys Earth, death from the skies. That would actually threaten biodiversity. And if humans had left Earth by then, we would be able to sit here and watch everything on Earth die, but we would lose biodiversity. And of course, this astronaut could never drink that beer with the helmet. It should probably be, the bottle needs to be empty, right? Otherwise, it would be boiling out of that. The other thing that's threatening biodiversity is overpopulation. And when you, that's just on a side note, when you Google overpopulation, it's always depicted in this way. It's always the others. Western newspapers always show other people from other countries as overpopulation. It's never a city, a, a sidewalk on Fifth Avenue in New York City. It's always other people in, a different, in other countries than us in the West. So overpopulation also threatens biodiversity because it gives one, um, one species um, a, an advantage over the others. There are more of this species than of the other species. So these are both things that actually threaten biodiversity. And um, if we go to space and want to relate space exploration with biodiversity and the threats to it, what immediately comes to mind and what has been portrayed within concepts of space exploration is the religious parallel of Noah's Ark. And this picture is <coughs> interesting in so far as it shows that, or as the story is perceived as, this story tells us that during a cataclysmic event there was this ship and every single animal that was to be saved was on that ship in a way that it was going to be able to reproduce after the cataclysmic event was over. So that's why there's two pa a pair of every animal coming off that ship. You all know that story. There's one interesting bit about this, um, this picture. When you look down here, and I hope you can see it, there's a lion eating a white horse-like animal. This is either a dead animal that has been left after the flood, but then it was dead for 40 days and the lion is eating it anyway, or maybe that is proof that the unicorn, unicorns were on the ark, but the lion added, and that's why there are no more unicorns. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that this idea of Noah's Ark as a parallel for space exploration and biodiversity means if we want to go out there, and this is in line with what I've just shown you about our conception of our concept of biodiversity, this is everything, we basically want to take everything because this is what we have here and we want that in outer space. And um, when you look at early concepts of space exploration, space colonies, this is actually what they depict and what they want these colonies to be like. That is suburban, maybe suburban America, maybe rural Europe, it could be Germany, my home country, but that is basically taking Earth the way it is and taking it out into space and having it there the way it is right now. There's actually a picture, if you want to Google that, uh, an early concept of a space colony called Island One. And uh, in the picture, in the background, there's the, um, the Golden Gate Bridge. So this, this concept, I mean, that's totally unfeasible in outer space, right? You don't need the Golden Gate Bridge. But it's basically taking Palo Alto out into outer space and taking what we already know from here. But do we want to go that way? If we went and took everything that we have here, some of the things we might not want to take, right? This is an artist's depiction of NASA's unplanned fire ant in space program. You would not want fire ants in your spacesuit. You would want to control the environment. You are going to create an artificial environment that is not Earth, not our Earth environment. And uh, when you just take this old concept of biodiversity, you would not think about that. But what does that mean to create an artificial environment? This is a work of art by Italian artist, hang on, Italian artist Giuseppe Pennone, and he's taken two stones of Carrara marble, one from a riverbed and one from a quarry. 
And the one stone he left as it was, and the other stone he turned into a copy of the first one. So we've got two stones, this one and that one. They are basically the same when you look at them. They are not the same. They come from totally different origins. And he just made them to look like the other one. That is a very, very interesting concept of art. This one stone, maybe this one or maybe the other, is truly artificial. And you can't differentiate between those two stones just by looking at them. You could probably do it if you take a closer look at the marble because Carrara marble that has been in a riverbed and Carrara marble that has been taken from a quarry from a different stratum will be slightly different chemically. But when you look at them, they will be the same. So the point I'm trying to make is, if we want to create an artificial environment, we need certain specifics of this environment to be exactly the same. That's what Pannone did and he just chose the, the outer layer, the, the visual impact. And we need other things to change, to have them completely different, or they will be completely different in accordance with the environment that we used to, that we reform into this artificial environment. And um, so what we need to do is we need to re-evaluate the ethical value of biodiversity. And I've just taken the picture of overpopulation and biodiversity next to each other. I'm going to try and play around with that a bit. As I've tried to tell you now, the state we're in now, biodiversity is positive and overpopulation is mostly negative because overpopulation threatens us, threatens our resource bases, threatens the future of humanity, and also threatens biodiversity. But what if we go on space missions. If, you, if, we, if we think about artificial environments on space missions as we have them now, the crew are vetted astronauts. They are not a representative part of population. They have been specially chosen, specially trained, and they do not represent a median of humanity. It's a very homogenic population. There is little or no diversity. Just think of ethnic diversity in the astronaut corps when that started and how, for how long there was no diversity, basically no diversity. There is no self-sufficiency in space exploration. Everything they take up, they, they need, they need to take up with them or it needs to be brought up to them. If you go one step further and think what would happen if humans lived in space or in planetary bodies permanently in habitats, that would be slightly less vetted. Other people would try to move there. There might, may be even something like space tourism. Um, still, it would be a very homogeneous group in the sense that a person who cannot walk, well, a person who cannot walk would actually do really well in microgravity, but certain illnesses would, would hinder you from going there. So it would still be very homogenic. You would have technical life support and you would perhaps have plant diversity as you would want to have some some food that you grow on your own. You would have perhaps mold problems. You would perhaps have bacteria grow in your spacecraft that you don't want, but you would have no self-sufficiency. So you would have a habitat that still needs outside resources, but is sort of an ecosystem in itself, which is May, which may be even be the case at the International Space Station. No, I don't really know that. But if you go one step further and think about colonizing or settling another planetary body, then you would, after a while, have the full scale of human diversity and you would need to have self-sufficiency. You would need to have animals and plants to live on you would probably need a biological life support system. I don't know how good technical life support systems could emulate an a, a thing like, we, like the atmosphere of the planet Earth. Um, but how would you control that? So in these different environments, the problem of overpopulation of biodiversity sort of reverse. 
While overpopulation is a problem as the human species goes and takes all the resources of this planet in space, it would be the other way around. We would want human population to be the only population of a spacecraft. We would want human population to be the first population of a space settlement. And they would be the ones who actually made that. So they would keep biodiversity in check and they would, they would need to. And when you look at the, the problems that we have with humans interfering with biodiversity, this is one of my most favorite animals because it's so human-like. Time-wise, am I good? Yes. Excellent. This is the cane toad. The cane toad was introduced to Australia by humans. They had a problem with this so-called cane grub that was eating the sugar canes, and they know that cane toads live in, I think, in Cuba. So they thought, hey, there must be a connection. No, cane, no sugar cane problem in Cuba. So we take the cane toad, and that will eat all the sugar, the, the, the cane grubs. There's one single simple problem with that. Cane grubs fly, cane toads don't. But the cane toad took to Australia, and the cane toad is living there, feasting on cat food, dog food, mice, other toads, and the cane toad is pretty poisonous. So people are not really happy with the cane toad because it kills dogs. A dog sees the cane toad, bites the cane toad, dies. A cat sees the cane toad feeding on its cat food, bites the cane toad, dies. And the vector for that cane toad was humans. We brought this cane toad to that environment, just as the uh, the other guys who were speaking just a minute ago, about just where, like we take E. coli, for instance, to the Mars Desert Research Station and then spread it around by walking. Um, the cane toad can also look pretty smug. I think that's the anthropomorphism for that. The cane toad is pretty happy in Australia. The other thing is. And this just shook me when I, when I look at, looked at invasive species. That's a python. It's been introduced by people who want to keep snakes in their homes. It's been introduced to Florida. That python is eating a bloody alligator, or at least it's, an, it's a problem for alligators. So what we did there, we humans who brought that thing there, was actually threatening one of the most threatening animals I can imagine with another threatening animal just because we wanted to keep that one as a pet. I don't even want to think about the things we could do to outer space if we behave that way. Um, then there is these so-called invisible passengers who, yeah, snakes on a plane. I mean, <laughs> That's not the real thing on the plane, right? I, I've never encountered a snake on a plane, but you can't take, so at home I have guinea pigs. If I wanted to go on holiday with my guinea pigs, I couldn't take them on a plane. They would, could run away and eat some cables. That would really be a problem. And that would really be a problem in outer space too. That's why NASA has invented this mice drawer system to do research on mice on the International Space Station but prevent them from going all over the place. But what about other invisible passengers? Do you drink coffee and tea on an airline, uh, on an airplane? You shouldn't. Um, there is something called a biofilm that sort of lives in the, in the tubes that uh, feed the water from the tank to the galley and um, this biofilm is there and it won't be killed off just by boiling it. That is, by, by the way, oh, the guy's already gone, by the way, also an answer to the question why we're not talking about mercury, it's just too hot for m microbes to live on. But, so we, we carry this stuff with us, right? We carry these germs with us and even if we want to kill them off, like 99.99%, they're still a lot of them left over once we're finished with killing them off. So um, maybe we will need to, well, we definitely want to think about that. And that is also part of biodiversity, although we don't see it at this point. And the other thing, and I just want to go into that very briefly, there is basically on most of the planetary bodies we know of nothing. It's magnificent desolation. And what do we want to bring there? Does this not have an ethical value of its own? And I know that's quite controversial, but if humans chose to settle the moon or Mars and there is nothing there, we will destroy nothingness. But we don't have a value for nothingness on Earth as everything is sort of alive in a whole ecosystem, but that would be completely different. So I'll just put that out as a point. If we want to talk about human population versus biodiversity, we would need the third angle, and that is magnificent desolation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.
one that was right quick. Uh, quick question. I understand the contrast between looking at I understand the contrast between looking at uh, plants and animals anthropocentrically as being accessories to our exploration mm -hmm. um, versus a more biocentric view of nature, whatever that would be in this context. And I guess what I've been struggling with is trying to understand the space in between, that is, human beings, anthropocentrically speaking, but with evolutionary good reason, have strong emotional, biological, social needs for other animals, other life around them, to be reminded that they're alive. No one in that 500-day-long Russian experiment at the Caterpillar, I think that's a poem, um, and I'm wondering, what would it look like if we got it right? Or is there a way of getting it right? <laughs> uh, I could say I don't know because I don't, but I'll, I'll give it a try, okay? So I think what this, this anthropomorphizing animal shows it, is that, that, um, that there is a strong feeling of us all being in this together, the spaceship Earth, the, the overview effect hypothesis, so that when you, when you look at it from the outside, it sort of looks like something that is all interconnected. And um, that way you would not want to be, maybe would not want to be out there alone. That's why we need vetted astronauts at the moment. And you would not want to put an animal out there on its or his or her own. But I think that what I'm trying to point out is that at the moment we have no problems uh, taking antibiotics and killing off um, a lot of life. In, uh, I don't have any problems with that, killing a lot of life inside myself, or we don't have problems in killing animals and eating them. But um, when we go out there, I was trying to make the point that literally, li literally our life could depend on our vetting the biosphere that we take with us. And so I think this, this, this oversimplified anthropomorphizing doesn't, so doesn't help us any. This is just, a, just a, the, the wrong way to look at biodiversity in this setting and maybe even in the setting that we have now. So vetting the biosphere that we take with us? Sorry? Vetting, vetting the biosphere. Yeah, vetting the biosphere that we take with us. We don't want to take everything that we can. can. I mean, we, it could be a good idea to say, hey, we might not, we might, after 20 years, we might discover, oh, if we only had that specific bacteria, that would help us solve this. So freezing them and taking them would maybe be a good idea. But I don't know if, if that is technically feasible. That's what I think about modern theologians, there are questions that never an answer. In the good old days, there were a lot of answers. The one of the questions, so this is... So, directly... I'm good, right? I'm modern. As a biologist, I understand why when a species goes extinct, we lose information about how that particular branch of life managed to solve a particular kind of problems that life is presented. And therefore, we go to Mars, and we encounter life there, and we kill it, we lose information. Yeah. And that's, say, big loss from the point of view of just total knowledge. But you just said a moment ago that you didn't think it was all that, well, let me ask the question as a yes or no question. Is it an ethical difference to you to go to Mars and terraform it so that we, it looks just like Earth and we can live on it if A, Mars doesn't have its own biosphere, or B, Mars does have its own biosphere? Um, so it's, it's, it's not a, I'll try to give a yes, no, I'll, I'll totally fail, okay, modern theologian. Um, so I think if Mars had its natural biosphere and we would try to terraform it, we would basically, in my understanding, kill their potential to, to have their own biosphere. You would then need to make the argument that for a long, long time nothing has happened on Mars and we are sort of coming in to help them along. And I could understand that as helping God's creation along or helping God's creatures along the way and say, yeah, that's probably a good idea. But the thing is, and that's where you come in, um, can we be sure that we'll be actually helping them along, right? If I want to make the theological argument that going out there and terraforming Mars in a way that helps this these this creatures along their way actually helps them along. So can we be sure about that? If, if you say yes, then I would say yes and probably 
screw up settling mass forever, but um, yeah, that would be my answer to that. <laughs> More questions? Okay, good, thank you.